Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar session today for the 2023 AIML in 5G Challenge. My name is Nina Shiro with ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. The Machine Learning in 5G Challenge, now in its fourth year, aims to create a community to solve network-related issues using machine learning. For returning participants to challenge, please be aware that this year, we will be running problem statements all year long, with each having their own respective deadlines, unlike in the previous years where we only had one overall deadline. So if you're interested in joining the competition this year, please make sure to check the respective deadlines and due dates for each problem statement. Today, we have a session titled Sustainable and Multifunctional Wireless Networks, the role of machine learning held by Christus from University College London, who is a recognized engineer and professor with interest in the field of wireless communications and signal processing, with particular focus on green communications, large-scale antenna systems, integrated sensing and communications, interference mitigation techniques for MIMO, and motor carrier communications. A future global cellular infrastructure will have to be able to support various applications such as smart city solutions, smart mobility, and others. In addition, compliance to the UN's SDGs will be paramount to sustainability and inclusiveness of AI and communication networks. First off, we'll introduce to us the necessary redesign of intelligent signals and waveforms for 6G and beyond to abide and respect to these new requirements. For today's session, we are counting on you, the participants, to help create an engaging discussion. So if you have any questions, please type them in the video wall, and we will take them during the Q&A session right after the talk. And without further ado, I would like to hand over the floor to Christos. Uh, thank you, Mia. Thanks for having me. Uh, let me try to share it. Okay, and I'm hoping everybody can see. And uh, just let me know if you cannot see or hear me. Um, so thanks again uh, very much, everyone, for inviting me to this. Uh, I'm happy that this is uh, my second appearance in, in, in this forum, and I'm always happy to support your activities. So today, as Mia said, I'll, I'll talk about sustainable and multifunctional uh, wireless networks. And in particular, uh, I'll try to highlight uh, what I think the role of uh, machine learning and AI uh, would be in such systems. So as Mia said, um, you know, the vision of future uh, generations of wireless infrastructure is to support not just, uh, not just next generation communications, with its ever-increasing KPIs like data rates, latency, and, and all kinds of uh, KPIs that we probably discussed uh, already in other seminars, but also includes, includes services such as localization through the cellular network, imaging and environment mapping, security applications making our uh, cities secure, uh, monitoring critical infrastructure, uh, monitoring uh, uh, the smart city, detecting incidents, accidents, and so on, and hopefully moving from the um, uh, network of cameras, which, which can be a bit pervasive, into a network where monitoring happens through electromagnetic signatures and sensors. Uh, also support smart mobility, connected cars, uh, smart traffic, uh, and finally, uh, building intelligence, not just for the wireless network, wireless network operation, its own, but also for the greater smart city environment. And, and what's best um, you know, uh, way of uh, gathering data than uh, sensing, so using sense data. So there's a host of services, of new, relatively new services that are coming with 6G uh, onwards. At the same time, uh, 6G will need to uh, support the UN's 
Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, there's quite a few of them, but I've highlighted a few things uh, here. So taking care of the planet, improving energy efficiency, supporting net zero operation in many industries, but also pursuing its own net zero operation as much as possible, uh, supporting uh, human health and well-being, uh, supporting data inclusion and including um, uh, people in, in many aspects of life where, where ICT can actually really make a difference, uh, supporting security, uh, safety, and privacy of individuals, and supporting the, uh, the resilience, robustness, robustness, a resilient economy, a resilient um, social uh, integration. Um, at the same time, uh, ICT uh, at the moment is uh, is uh, consuming about two percent of global CO two emissions. Uh, and if that doesn't sound uh, you know big enough to you, uh, I'd say this is comparable to the aviation industry. So there's uh, significant um, uh, consumption there, and that's you know the consumption that ICT on its own uh, is, is consuming. Of course, as I said, ICT is really a means to, to help reduce uh, consumption and achieve net zero for all kinds of other uh, industries. Uh, now, uh, another thing that's happening, uh, uh, a problem that uh, I'll try to uh, address in, in the next few slides, is that of, um, um, of, of power consumption. I forgot to say that the, the power here that we're talking about is the operational power. So let's say the power consumed during the operation of a cellular system, for example, but also the embodied energy. The embodied energy represents stuff that ha happens not in the operation um, at the time, but at times, uh, you know, for producing devices. Uh, so the the energy embodied in setting up the system and you know uh, setting up the architecture. In relation to the second one, uh, you know, a, an existing observation and existing a coming uh, challenge is the inclusion of too many sensors and emitters in, in uh, future systems. A classical example is the vehicular uh, example. So connected vehicles will need to support a number of communication modes, so vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to pedestrian, and all kinds of other uh, connectivity. Uh, at the same time, they will have a host of sensors on board from cameras and LIDAR, which is the optical uh, counterpart of radar, and quite a few uh, separate radar uh, systems on so long range radar for uh, cruise control, medium range radar for cross traffic alert and so on, short range for parking assist uh, and so on. So you can see that each of these, uh, if they require uh, their own device, their own system, have a, a growing population of systems. And this is recognized by the 5G Association that estimates that cars nowadays and uh, looking uh, onwards, we'll have more than 200 sensors per car. Uh, and Cisco predicts that the numbers of sensors and transmitters will grow to more than uh, 40 billion by 2027. This is at a time where we're in the middle of a silicon crisis, a chip crisis. So we cannot really afford to, to have this growth of devices. And of course, this growth of devices will eventually to, uh, lead to a growth of uh, electronic waste, right? Um, devices that uh, find their way to land. So this is clearly not sustainable. And in this talk, I'll, I'll try to uh, discuss what uh, signal processing can do, which is you know, my area of research. What, what can we do in, in terms of signal processing uh, to address this? And I'll be talking uh, about two main things. So signaling design to, uh, uh, to save power by recycling uh, uh, power in a wireless uh, link in a wireless downlink in particular. So exploiting this green interference power, so power that's already there in the air, and we're just exploiting it to improve performance. And signaling uh, to enable dual use of hardware and devices. Uh, so that's what we uh, talk about, uh, what we mean when you talk about, um, uh, about multifunctional devices, multifunctional uh, networks. Uh, now, what uh, in broad terms, how can AI help in machine learning? So in general, uh, in the communications domain, what we uh, rely on machine learning uh, for is typically to address mathematically non-practical problems. So perhaps uh, examples include uh, you know, hardware limitations where it's very difficult to, to model hardware uh, or complex
complex, you'll see here some examples of complex um, signaling design where it's not easy to do mathematically. Uh, or if we know how to do things mathematically and we can find an optimal way of doing things analytically, then machine learning can be used to, to drastically reduce complexity in, in some of these problems. Uh, now, how can we tune uh, neural networks from a communication side of view? Uh, I think you know, key uh, novelties here is discussing and introducing uh, new loss functions and architectures for neural networks that are more comms oriented that depart from the classical ones that have been developed for computer vision uh, and such applications. Uh, another thing we need to address is the limited online training. In computer vision, you can train forever, and then you know, you, you typically, for example, you classify static images, right? That means you can train for a long time, and it's the inference time that uh, might be uh, important. In uh, communications, you often have dynamic uh, uh, scenarios. You have changing channels, you have changing topologies of uh, transmitters and receivers, you have nodes coming in and out of the network. So the training itself has to be adaptive and, and quick. So I think that's a challenge and interesting challenge to uh, And the other thing that I'll, 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 I'll try to uh, cover in my uh, slides is addressing complexity. So uh, a lot of these platforms will have to be deployed in uh, uh, you know, power limited devices or computationally limited devices or memory limited devices. So uh, it's interesting to look at ways of reducing complexity, reducing memory consumption when you deploy these uh, AI. And I think there's some opportunities we can exploit in particular in the communications domain. So unlike uh, computer vision, for example, where you don't really have any analytical models and, uh, or, or any models you can practically use to, to classify images, for example, in communications, we have you know, decades of uh, you know, analytical signal processing on how to transmit signals, how to detect signals, and so on. So we have very good uh, already signal, classical signal processing solutions. So we don't want to throw all these away and replace these with neural networks. We can be a bit more strategic, and that's what um, uh, leads us to this hybrid model-based or classical-based uh, processing and data-driven uh, approach. And I'll try to, to show a couple of examples as we go along. So let's start with the, the first part. So in this part, I'll briefly talk about um, signaling for sustainability in terms of reusing interference, exploiting this green interference that I talked about. Uh, so, uh, what what uh, what is the aim here of this? So, going back to this uh, diagram, so we have, if you look at these a bit more carefully, you have two main components. So, this is the base station consumption, operation, and embodied, and this is the consumption at the bone bio unit, uh, the UE. So, the two big components is the consumption at the base station and the embodied energy at the mobile. That means the power that is being consumed during the operation of the base station and how, uh, you know, what we can do in terms of signal processing uh, for that is um, uh, what I'll talk about later on. And the second, the embodied um, energy is the relation to the complexity to the architecture of your plan. And this is typically addressed by using pre-coding techniques during downlink transmission, detection during uplink transmission, so that the mobile doesn't have to do a lot of uh, processing. And it can, it can uh, you know, throw away with uh, uh, reduce the uh, complexity. Now, what I'll be focusing on is, is this element. And the idea here is to reuse interference that you typically have in a, in a downlink transmission between uh, different transmissions to different users. Uh, typically, uh, interference is treated as a harmful effect, but I'm hoping to convince you that in some cases in the downlink, uh, you can actually reuse that interference power to gain extra. Uh, signal power and improve the quality of your service without having to invest uh, transmit power. Or equivalently, if you meet a certain uh, quality of service threshold, that means you can actually reduce the power consumption and the transmit power from your base state. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the downlink uh, system, so a base station transmitting to a number of uh, mobile users. Uh, I won't go through the math, but the key element here is the transmit power. So if W is our pre-coding uh, vector for each um, uh, mobile unit, the transmit power is the sum of the norms of the different pre-coding vectors. And uh, we're going to be using uh, classical signal-to-noise ratio expressions and departing from those uh, to, to address, uh, to, to enable constructive interference. 
so what do I mean by this? So let's look at some of the very classical benchmarks in terms of uh, pre-coding at the base station. So pre-coding is how you pre-shape your signal before transmission so that it arrives at the receiver uh, having addressed interference. So the classical benchmarks design the pre-coding uh, uh, vectors such that uh, the received signals um, uh, uh, appear at the receiver with minimal interference. And if you look at a constellation point, this is, a, 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 for example, a QPSK constellation, we're looking at one of the constellation points. You want your received signal to lie within a circle or a sphere uh, uh, around the, the nominal constellation point. So you want to minimize interference so that your, uh, your received signal is actually close to the, the transmit signal in the constellation. Uh, and you have two classical, very classical recording approaches. One is power minimization, when you try to to minimize the total uh, power subject to quality of service constraint. And this is a typical uh, uh, signal to noise ratio constraint where you have the information of uh, the intended user is the useful signal power. All other interference, so the information transmitted to the other user is destructive, so it's uh, in, in the denominator and noise. Uh, the, the, the dual problem of that is what we call the SINR balancing. Here you want to maximize the SNR essentially. So in, uh, in particular, this maximizes the minimum SNR among all the users subject to a power button. Power button. Uh, and you can see here that both these systems uh, treat interference as a harmful effect. You can see interference here reduces my uh, SNR. Now, uh, what, I, what I want to pitch to you is that not all interference is harmful. Uh, so, uh, in particular, in the in the downlink uh, transmission, uh, you are the base station. You have you typically have channel knowledge for all the users, and you know all the data you want to transmit to each and every user. That means you can actually predict the the interference that the, the users are going to face. And if we take an elementary example, not always uh, interference is uh, destructive. So I'll show you this elementary example with two transmit antennas at the base station and two users. And let's look at what this uh, user receives from each antenna, channel H1 and H2. Now, when the two channels are orthogonal in the ideal case, and let's say I transmit, I assume I transmit for a BPSK, so a one or a minus one for this elementary example. So if I transmit a one on channel two, and this antenna transmits a minus one on channel one, and these two channels are orthogonal, this is what my received signal is. And if at the receiver, I apply a typical match, mil match filter, so that means projecting back uh, the received signal on each of the channel ac axes, you see in the absence of noise that I receive exactly what I transmit, right? Orthogonal transmission, no interference, so I receive exactly uh, what I transmit. In the second case, the channels are no longer orthogonal, and you can see this uh, by uh, the, the angle uh, between the two channels. In this case, I transmit the same two signals, one and minus one. The received signal is this guy over here, so it has a reduced amplitude because of the destructive interference in this case. And when I project back to the channels, I have reduced uh, received signal. So in this case, each of the received signals have suffered because of destructive uh, interference. There's a third case, however, where when the correlation of the two channels is uh, such that we have constructive interference, you see here, this is what I transmit, a one and a minus one. They add up constructively, so a higher received signal power, even higher than the orthogonal case. And when I project back to the channel axis, I have, again, a higher amplitude in the received signal. That means my signal has actually benefited from interference from the other user. And that's what we're going to try to exploit in, in, in this signal test. And how do we do that? We do that by looking at the modulation uh, uh, level of the received signal directly. And here's the, the, the simple example of BPSK that I spoke about earlier. One and minus one are my nominal constellation points. This is my uh, decision threshold. Now, anything that pushes, any interference that pushes my uh, signal away from the decision threshold is constructive. So these green dots here represent constructive interference. Anything that pushes me towards the decision threshold is destructive. Uh, and you can see how uh, now you can characterize constructive and destructive interference and then design your signal processing to benefit. And you can extend this to 
higher order PSK, and these are the green shaded areas where you benefit from constructive interference for PPSK and HPSK, and so on and so forth. And we've been applying this uh, for a few years. We, we've been working on this area for more than 15 years in, in our group, and myself, uh, since my PhD as well. And you can find some of the early works here, where already we've been uh, showing that you can uh, achieve more than 10 times power reduction uh, in small scale uh, downlinks uh, for uh, a given symbol error rate of uh, compared to classical zero forcing recording or uh, classical recording. Uh, now I'm going to focus a bit on optimization based recording, and I, I'll hopefully jump into uh, you know machine learning uh, based recording. So the principle of exploiting interference is taking a classical optimization problem, like the power minimization that I presented to you earlier, this is our benchmark, and replacing classical SNR constraints with constraints that will allow uh, constructive interference and exploiting interference. So to do that, you need to come up with a mathematical characterization. Uh, and, and the idea here is I no longer constrain my signal to be within a circle, let's say, of the, of the transmitted signal, but I allow it, I open up the, the margins here so that uh, the signal can move further away from the decision thresholds of the constellation. This is an example of QPSK, so the one plus J uh, constellation point of QPSK. And by doing that, I benefit from constructing this. Now, how do I do that? If you take this constellation point and rotate uh, everything, by the phase of this constellation point, all constellation points will fall onto uh, the real axis. And all constructive regions in the constellation will fall onto uh, this green shaded area. Then using basic uh, trigonometry, you can come up with uh, criteria so that your received signal lies in this green shaded uh, constructive interference uh, constellation. Area. And if you do your geometry, you'll end up with this um, metric this constraint, where these two guys are the real and imaginary part of your received signal. And importantly, gamma is an SNR parameter. Gamma will tell you, gamma is here, it will tell you how close or how far my signal uh, is going to lie from the decision pressure. So essentially, how susceptible your uh, detection is to noise. So essentially, how big your signal to noise ratio is going to be. And with that, uh, you can go into classical problems and uh, replace classical SNR constraints with these constructive uh, interference uh, constraints. You might be thinking this only applies to, PS to PSK constellation. It doesn't. Uh, we've applied this to PAM constellations, and here is the basic idea. You can apply constructive interference to the outer constellation points, which have no uh, um, decision thresholds uh, in all directions. And you can also uh, apply constructive interference to the inner constellation points. Once you extend these constellation points towards um, the outer parts of the constellation, that means you can also allow some constructive interference for the inner constellation. You're extending essentially your constellation. And here are the mathematical criteria for, for each of them. So, as I said, you can go back to classical pre coding uh, optimizations and replace classical SNR constraints with these constructive constraints. And you can recognize here the real and imaginary part of the received signal. And gamma is the, the SNR I want to achieve. The SNR I replace here with this uh, power minimization, SNR balance. And without going into too much technical detail, just the number of uh, benefits that I think are very important in, in uh, cellular uh, links. So an obvious benefit, as I mentioned already, is the power uh, uh, gain. Right, we compare here the average transmit power with different SNR thresholds. And you can see, uh, for perhaps this is the more critical scenario, we have a four by four system, so four transmit antennas, four single antenna users using QPSK. And you can see savings of more than five dB just by exploiting interference. This is interference that's already living in, in the air, right? It's, it's there because uh, of the multi user transmission. And just by, let's say, reusing this screen interference, recycling uh, signal power, uh, you have a massive power reduction uh, from conventional, um, compared to conventional approach. Uh, beyond power consumption, another important benefit is the ability to support more users in, in the downlink. 
So having overloaded uh, downlink systems. So here's a feasibility probability. So the probability I can serve uh, the number of users with an increasing uh, number of users. Um, sorry, with, uh, with an increasing number of antennas, given that I have four users uh, to serve. So you can see that uh, conventional approaches, you have to have at least equal number of antennas to the users. Four, five, and six is where you are feasible. Well, for uh, constructive uh, pre-coding, you have feasibility in the cases where you have less antennas than users. And that means you can either save on, on numbers of antennas and RF chains and power consumption of the base station, or you can actually support more users for a fixed uh, antenna configuration, which again improves energy efficiency uh, in, in many obvious ways. Right? So again, ways to, to, to improve the power consumption uh, with respect to what we have. Another important benefit is that once you um, uh, replace these constraints, which are only channel dependent constraints, with data and channel dependent constraints, here, if you look closely, you have data symbols. That means that uh, um, the, here's the example of an SNR constraint. That means that from average SNR constraints, you move on to uh, symbol by symbol SNR constraints. And if you look closely in classical uh, problems, you see because this is an average constraint, depending on what uh, data I multiply my precoding with, it, there's a distribution of the actual SNR you can achieve. So your constraint may be 20 dB, but you can do much better than that depending on the distribution, but also you can do much worse than that. And if my mobile unit needs 20 dB to operate, to be able to decode reliably, if I'm in this ra uh, range over here, that means I'm in an outage. So I'm losing the load. And you circumvent this uh, important drawback uh, with this interference exploitation. This also goes by the name symbol level precoding, by the way, because it's a symbol by symbol uh, design. And in this case, you make sure that for every symbol combination, you meet um, your SNR constraint. So you avoid these kind of outages that you have in classical systems. And what about complexity? So first thing is, so here we have conventional and here we have interference exploitation coding. The first thing to acknowledge is, as this is a symbol by symbol uh, optimization, uh, sorry, symbol by symbol design, this incurs a symbol by symbol uh, optimization and symbol by symbol process. So you have to process each symbol, uh, each group of symbols um, uh, one by one. Uh, so you have a penalty at the, in terms of complexity at the transmitter side, which is the base station, where typically you have more computational resources. But on the other hand, you gain a lot in terms of processing power at the uh, mobile. So in, in classical beamforming, that the, like the examples I showed you, you typically uh, design this um, composite channel by, you know, with classical SNR constraints. And that means that the receiver will need to equalize this composite channel, and that means it will have to either estimate this composite channel or have some feed forward from the base station. So that's extra signaling, that's extra processing for the, the mobile unit, not just for this processing, but also estimating the channel uh, and so on. And you completely avoid all this with constructive interference pre-coding because you receive signals already lie in the right constellation points of the constellation, so you don't need to equalize anything. So there's massive uh, uh, complexity reduction at the receiver side. And this comes at a cost of complexity increase uh, on uh, the transmit. And here's an example area where machine learning can come in and reduce complexity. We know how to do this optimally, but we can uh, um, employ machine learning approaches to uh, reduce our complexity. Um, and before I show you an example, uh, just to convince you that this actually works, and it's not just theory, uh, we've we uh, tried this in our lab in UCL. This is a snapshot of our equipment, USRP equipment in our lab. Here we emulate a base station with uh, six antennas, and we have two users, one antenna each. Uh, and this is kind of a, an area of view of, of our lab. And we've been able to transmit uh, over the air and uh, observe these constellations uh, over the air. And you can see constellations without recording, very blurry constellations, very difficult to use. Detect constellations with zero, zero forcing. You can see the constellation points concentrated in all directions around the nominal uh, constellation. 
uh, that's QP escape, by the way. And this constructive interference. And you can see if this is my nominal constellation point, the, the received signal is all in all the constructive directions uh, of the constellation. This is over the air transmission, and we've observed this uh, over the air. And we've seen experimentally over the air gains of uh, up to 5 dB in, a, in this relatively small uh, scale system, right? Six antennas at the base station to uh, you. And of course, you can uh, deduce how much uh, you have to, you, 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 there's, there is to gain in more large scale systems uh, in, in today's uh, cellular system. And you can find the details in, in these. Uh, now, um, I haven't talked about machine learning so far, so I'll give you one example of how I think um, data-driven approaches can, can help here. So um, here's one way of reducing uh, the actual complexity. So we've taken the analytical, uh, uh, so the optimization-based approach, and you can uh, actually design uh, data-driven approaches, as I said, to reduce complexity. How we do that? We do this by model-based uh, uh, learning, is what I was referring to before, where you take you know, uh, approaches where you know the analytical solution. You don't need to throw that away and replace it with a neural network. You can use uh, neural network uh, uh, approaches based on this uh, analytical solution. So we first take the, the Lagrangian uh, of this uh, problem, and you can then, using the Lagrangian, design an iterative uh, approach. And then we use a class of machine learning uh, techniques called uh, unfolding or unrolling, uh, which, which essentially what it does is it takes the different iterations of the algorithm and replaces those with uh, uh, neural network layers. So each iteration is represented by a layer in your neural network. And you, you see the structure uh, here. So each iteration that we would have in this iterative algorithm is replaced by a layer in the neural network. And then you have some uh, outer layers like normalization and so on. And, and taking this one step further, uh, we try to address the problem of uh, complexity and memory consumption. So we're looking at uh, what happens if you, if you don't have, uh, let's say, infinite uh, resolution in terms of uh, the weights, and instead you have quantized weights, so you have a finite number of bits with which you describe your weights. And we've actually been looking at extreme neural network quantization, uh, where you have the extreme gains in memory and complexity. So we've been looking at binary quantization. So here's your weight vector, and you represent these plus or minus one, depending on whether weights are positive or negative. You can have what's called ternary quantization, so plus and minus one, and also zero, whenever your weights are uh, too small, smaller than a given threshold. And you can uh, extend these to stochastic quantization, where you have plus and minus one with a certain probability depending on the value of your weight. And you can see here where you, you can take now a uh, uh, you know, neural network with a given uh, precision or with infinite precision that is typically assumed uh, and replace those with quantized uh, networks. And you can replace the whole system with quantized or you can uh, replace partial, uh, partially replace uh, the system with uh, quantized mode. And that will give you scalable trade. And uh, first, let's look at the, the performance, what we can achieve. Uh, so this is PSK, so QPSK example, four by four system, four transmit antennas per users. This is the transmit power with increasing uh, SNR threshold. This is what classical beamforming can do, so block level uh, beamforming, like power minimization, classical one. This is what uh, symbol level precoding, so interference exploitation too. And then the quantized neural networks are these approaches here. So when you have no quantization, so this is the, the D net, so a learning based approach, unfolding based approach without quantization, you have the blue line here, very close to optimal uh, optimization based approach, uh, uh, simply through training. And then once you uh, quantize, you have binary and ternary quantization here. And once you have stochastic quantization, so you have a, a performance loss, and this loss is uh, reduced when you have stochastic uh, quantization, these two lines. The important part is the complexity, the, the average execution time. This is per, per optimization. So this is conventional um, uh, problems, so uh, block level precoding. This is symbol level precoding. 
And you can see here, I forgot to say execution time versus increasing number of users. Uh, conventional systems in four antennas will go up to four users. Uh, symbol error precoding can go, as we said, serve more users than antennas. And the pair optimization complexity is similar to both. But what is the, the key difference? That uh, conventional will need to, you can you need to optimize once every coherence type of a channel. Uh, symbol level precoding, you need to optimize on a symbol by symbol basis. And that's what increases the complexity. And that's what calls for reducing uh, solutions to reduce complexity. And you can see the complexity reduction for uh, the, the, the training based data driven approaches that I mentioned. So up to, I would say, uh, four times reduction in complexity through this training. But you can further reduce complexity uh, by trading off uh, with performance. And these are the trade off uh, results. So here the trade off is based on increasing the quantization ratio. So the ratio of neural, uh, of network or of neurons that I quantize to one bit from input and input precision. And you can see how uh, the transmit power is traded off with um, memory, essentially. Right, the quantization memory will translate to model sizes and memory. And you can see a graceful increase in the transmit power of about up to 2 dB, let's say, for uh, the binary quantization, and of about 1 dB for the ternary quantization by going all the way from a full network and quantizing the whole network. So 100% of the network is quantized to only one bit of the switch. Uh, and this is for uh, an SNR of 30, this for an SNR of 15 dB. Uh, and of course, already all of these, as we said, are much more power efficient than classical block level precoding, which consumes uh, a few dB more of transmit power. And the direct trade off uh, of power versus model size, so memory in megabytes and numbers of operations clock, is shown here. Again, you can see when your priority is. Uh, to, to reduce memory, you can reduce memory with a graceful increase in the average power. When your priority is to reduce uh, power consumption, then you can reduce power consumption by increasing the memory consumption uh, of your uh, implementation. So the main message here is that you can design flexible trade-offs between the memory you consume in the, in the practical deployment of such techniques and the transmit power uh, savings that you can achieve. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll stop here uh, for this uh, first part. If you're interested in, in constructive interference and you want to find out more, here's some early works on constructive interference, some overview papers uh, that uh, you can look into. Uh, we'll be sharing the slides so you, you'll have your own expertise if you're interested. Some beamforming approaches for constructive interference. We've been applying constructive interference to all kinds of other areas, so making this hardware efficient, so constant envelope precoding, so um, uh, taking into account power amplifiers that don't have a, a high dynamic range. Applying this to hybrid analog digital precoding, this is a class of techniques that allows many antennas at the base station, but only few RF chains. Applications to massive MIMO systems, so uh, massive antenna arrays. Uh, closed form approaches where we minimize complexity. This is our paper on, on prototyping and over the air experimentation. Uh, these are the two papers that I uh, mentioned on machine learning based approaches. And we've been applying to uh, all kinds of other areas like full duplex, security, physical and security, rate splitting, uh, joint communication and radar transmission that I'll be talking about in a minute, and multi cell constructive interference exploitation, where you can exploit not only the, the interference between your own users, but also interference from other cells. Uh, and now this leads me to the second part. Uh, uh, and I'll, I understand I'll need to wrap up in the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, so uh, the next thing I want to talk about is what the signal design can do in terms of hardware reuse and uh, multifunctionality and reducing not only power consumption, but hardware, devices, chip demand, uh, electronic waste, and, and all that stuff I spoke about earlier. Uh, and that's through uh, multifunctional uh, networks. So looking back into all these um, services that we mentioned, that the, the network, the future networks will need to support, 
if you look at all these closely, what they boil down to is two fundamental functions. That of communications, which we've been developing for you know, five generations of networks over more than 50 years, but also this new functionality of sensing. So localization will require some sensing, imaging requires sensing, incident detection, connected cars will require sensing and obstacle detection. And of course, building intelligence means gathering data, and gathering data means sensing and, uh, and sharing that sensed information. So sensing and communications is, is basically the, 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 base, the basis of the design of future networks, at least in my own. Uh, so what I want to uh, pitch to you is the, uh, the ability or the opportunity to signal signaling design, signal processing, to enable the dual use of base station. So, so a base station that is dual functional and with the same signal transmission, with the same channel use, with one uh, device and ultimately, ultimately a common infrastructure, can transmit a signal that is good for conveying information to communication users, while at the same time detecting targets at a distance. And um, if you extend this to a network level design, so first of all, what I forgot to say is compared to spectrum coexistence approaches between radar and communications, so having separate radar systems, separate communication systems which interfere. They have to uh, you know, compete for the same spectrum, compete for power, who's going to shout, shout uh, louder, uh, and often clash and uh, you know, lead to outages. Here, by the co-design of the two, you have the opportunity to uh, have the two systems cooperate and uh, introduce mutual benefits between the two. And then once you go into a network level design, uh, and uh, you know you can exploit the dense uh, cell deployment of 5G uh, that's happening already. And now, if you uh, think uh, uh, that now each access point on a lamppost, on a uh, side, uh, uh, on a wall of a building, has the capability not just for communications but also sensing and operate as a radar at the same time, then you have a wireless network, a cellular network that can also sense. So that would be a big coordinated uh, sensor. Of an unprecedented scale, right? Each base station, whenever it's, it transmits a signal, can also sense at the same time. That means making radar applications and sensing services a commodity, and a lot of industries already are talking about sensing as a service. A, a few gains of this. So, obviously, is, uh, an obvious one is the hardware gain that I talked about. So, where before you had two different devices, two different systems, an access point and a radar, each consuming power each consuming uh, spectrum, uh, each with its own uh, device, hardware implementation consuming silicon. And now you have one device that does both at the same time. So reducing power, reducing complexity, reducing chip demand. And so Another obvious gain is the spectrum. The spectrum also uh, translates to energy. Where before you had separate spectra for radar, separate for communications, and that had to live in the same uh, spectrum with all other kinds of applications. Now you have a spectrum through this dual transmission. You have a spectrum that does both. And that means you can make more space for all the other applications that demand the spectrum. And a couple of less obvious gains are the ability to, to, to do scalable trade off between communication and sensing. So once you now co design these two systems from a single transmission, a single device, you can create flexible trade off between. And I'm, I'm hoping to show a few of those as we go. And going beyond trading off performance, where one system sacrifices performance for the benefit of the other system, you can also design mutual synergy between the two, where the sensing operation assists the communication bottom line performance, and vice versa. The communication operation assists the sensing accuracy and the sensing reliability. And also, you can design synergies with other critical application, uh, operations of the network, such as security. Now, in terms of signaling, how do you make this happen by signaling design? So there's three uh, categories of techniques that uh, uh, you can use to do this. Well, one is what we call radar-centric design, and the main principle is this one. So you take a radar waveform, a well-known radar waveform, like a chirp or a linear frequency modulated waveform, uh, and you somehow modulate information onto that waveform. And then suddenly you have a waveform 
that has a dual functionality. It does its own radar business, while at the same time conveying some information. And there's a few different um, uh, techniques that you can use um, uh, that I'm not going to go into too much detail. But the main idea is to somehow modulate information on a uh, radar wave. The second approach is what we call the communication-centric design, where you take a communication waveform, like an OFDM waveform that is, is doing its uh, usual communication business, and you use that as a reference signal for radar detection. And then again, you have a dual functionality, so your usual communication uh, signaling, but also capable to, uh, to detect. Now, there's benefits and, and issues with each of these. Obviously, the, I think the, the major benefit is radar-centric design is very compatible to radar. You can just take a radar, and with minimal signaling changes, you now have a dual function design. You, and the same goes for com-centric design. So you can take a communication system uh, and uh, very simply use that for uh, radar detection. And that's with minimal changes in the standard, minimal changes in the signaling, uh, and so on. The limitations are that radar signaling is not designed for communications, and that means there's a limit to the amount of information you can convey in this uh, form. So you have limited uh, data rate, and there's uh, and communication signaling is not designed for uh, radar detection. Again, you have limited radar reliability, and it's very difficult to scale further uh, the the estimation accuracy of the radar. And that's where the third uh, degree comes in. That of jointly optimized design. And that's where, because you're co-designing the signals from the start, you can have this very flexible trade-off for from radar-only transmission in radar-critical applications, such as aviation, for example, to communications-only uh, transmission in communications-critical applications, such as, uh, let's say, remote surgery, where you need to have a communication link, high-speed communication link all the time, no out and anywhere in between by tuning your signal design. So uh, I'll show you one example of this trade-off. So here's our, our scenario. We have an access point uh, or a, a dual functional base station that's trying to transmit to a number of users while at the same time with the same signal detecting the target at a distance. Again, without going into too much detail, X is the signal, the transmit signal, the signal I'm trying to design for dual functionality. H is the communication channel between the users. Z is the noise. Now, if S is the information signal you want to convey, anything that lives inside your transmission that is not S is multi-user interface. And you can use that as your communication method. And with that, you can build a joint optimization of radar and communications. And here's a, an elementary example of this. So here we're minimizing the mutual information. So we're making sure we have nice, clean communication signals. Well, at the same time, minimizing the distance of the waveform we're designing to an ideal radar wave. So if X0 is a radar waveform, and there's many ways you can design radar-only waveforms, it's, you know, the literature is vast. Here, you're minimizing the distance of what you actually transmit to an ideal radar wave. And you can see here that I'm jointly optimizing a communications metric and a radar. And the key trade-off parameter is this weighting factor. Low is a scalar between zero and one. When you're close to zero, this guy goes away and I'm focusing on radar. When low is close to one, this guy is close to zero. This guy goes away and I'm focusing on communication. And you can have all kinds of constraints. There's the total power constraint. We're talking about power and energy and sustainability, but you can have other constraints such as pair antenna power, constant modular signaling, uh, PAPR, so peak to average power ratio, and, and many others. Uh, and the key uh, message here is through this um, uh, signaling design, you can actually directly trade off radar performance and communication. And here's an example. Here we have the radar probability of detection against the communications achievable rate. And you can see that I can go all the way from radar priority, radar only uh, priority, so a very good probability of detection, all the way to communications priority, where I have my maximum communication rate. This is bits per second per hertz per user. and But also all the way in between. I can flexibly trade off the performance between these two 
So any point in this curve I can achieve by tuning the weighting. Uh, importantly, even if I put all my priority on radar, I still have a non-negligible communication grade. If and if I put all my priority on uh, communications, I still have something better than a random grade, a random grade, right? A zero point. And also, as you increase the degrees of freedom of your system, this trade-off becomes more and more benign. That means I can achieve my maximum rate with a much smaller sacrifice in the radar. And again, this is not theory. We've tried this over the air in our lab. And here's our, uh, our test bed in our communications lab. So our base station, six antennas, two communication users, and we're emulating uh, um, uh, a search towards a direction where we assume there's a target. So we're creating a beam towards a given direction, and we're measuring the quality of that beam through this uh, directional antenna uh, that we see. And this allows us to observe a direct trade-off over the air between the two. So these are the communication constellations for QPSK. This is the radar uh, beam pattern for the radar operation. You can see where I put all my priority on uh, communications. I have a nice clean constellation at the receiver, QPSK, so very reliable detection, but very little in terms of radar beam pattern design. As I increase my priority towards radar, I have more blurry constellations, so more noise, more interference, uh, but a noticeable uh, radar uh, beam. So I will have some uh, an improvement in my radar detection. And again, when I put my, all my priority in radar, I have a, a, a you know, significant radar beam, so a good radar SNR, good radar echo, but at the cost of a very messy constellation, so I need to do a lot of processing at the receiver to return. And we've seen this, we've observed this graceful uh, degradation of bit error rate as I increase the radar priority over the air. These are over the air bit error rates. And we've gone one step further in actually using this radar beam to, to do some very elementary activity detection. So we have here a joint communication and activity detection where we are emulating a, a people's counter. So uh, having something blocking the beam. So this is our beam, the direction of our beam, and we're blocking that beam with its obstacle. So emulating somebody passing by, passing through the beam. And we are able with, with basic uh, you know, power detection, so detecting different power levels at the, at the by static receiver to, um, um, to, to reliably detect whether or not uh, there's somebody in between uh, in within our beam. Right? Uh, so here we have the probability of detection, probability of false alarm, typical uh, radar detection metrics. And you have a nice decision gap here where if you're operating here, you have reliable detection uh, whether or not the target is in the middle. And um, you know, the approach I showed you earlier tries to optimize communications while minimizing distance to a radar uh, uh, waveform. So I'm trying to approximate a radar waveform. But we can do better than that by actually optimizing a bottom line radar metric. And here's a very elementary example where we're actually minimizing the frame around bound. This is a typical radar uh, estimation metric subject to communication SNR and a total power consumption. And now we're not trying to approximate a radar uh, beam pattern, but we're actually designing, uh, sorry, optimizing the bottom line metric. Uh, even, even so, we still have a nice clean beam pattern for the radar, but the uh, key benefits are in the performance. So here we have another trade-off, the CRB for uh, radar estimation against the communication SNR. And I'll focus on these three lines. So these two lines represent uh, waveform approximation for the radar. And this is what you get with uh, uh, CRB minimizer. And you see a gain of about 3 dB, uh, but by just uh, optimizing the bottom line. Uh, what's the problem here? The problem again is complexity. I'm solving an optimization. And in particular, the CRB can be a very demanding, uh, analytically demanding uh, method. Uh, and here's, uh, again, this is where I talk a little bit about uh, a data-driven approach, where, again, we, we've used uh, a similar idea of that, that of unfolding to solve this problem. So here, uh, we formulate a similar problem. Here, you'll notice we have a CRB as our objective, and we replace the classical SNR constraints with constructive interference, so the stuff I was talking about earlier, and a total power constraint. Again, the process is the same. 
you can uh, reformulate this optimization such that you can split it into two uh, alternating optimizations. So one uh, optimization is here, another optimization is there. Again, I won't go into the mathematical detail, but the idea is that I alternate by optimizing uh, uh, over this optimization. And then once I find my solution, then I optimize in the second optimization. Then I can have an iterative approach. And then there's a, the opportunity to use again unfolding, where you take the iterations, you unfold them, and this is the representation here, and then you can represent each iteration by a neural network or a layer in a neural network. Again, won't be going into the details, but you can see here the correspondence of the math with the different um, optimization problems. And a couple of indicative results. You can see here how uh, NMSC, so this is the estimation error uh, for sensing, and how it uh, declines with the increase of iterations or the increase, increase of layers. So 10 iterations in the optimization, I can have 10 layers. 15 iterations, 15 layers, and so on. And you can see how you have significant reduction in, in the estimation error as I increase the number of layers, so the complexity of the neural network. Uh, and the same uh, goes with the increase in training sample. Right? So as I increase my training, again, obviously, I have uh, a better test. So again, a trade-off between uh, complexity and uh, bottom line. Data. And the direct trade-off between communication and sensing, so communication, sorry, sensing, MSC, so estimation error, against communication, SNR. And you can see, as I put my priority on communications, I have, again, a graceful degradation of the rate of performance and vice versa. And the complexity gains are shown here uh, versus uh, classical optimization. So this is versus the POMS radar optimization, but with uh, classical uh, SNR constraints, so that the scheme I showed you earlier. And this is how the complexity explodes. So we measure complexity here in terms of uh, elapsing time and, and running this code. And you can see uh, significant uh, savings maybe an order of magnitude savings for the learning-based uh, approach. Uh, and now the, the other uh, topic I'd like to talk about in the three minutes I have left is what we do. So, so far is what we do at the signaling design. So how we shape our signals at the transmitter. There's also nice problems at the receiver design uh, for uh, Isaac, for dual functional radar and communication. Uh, now, the challenge here, if we look at this system as an example, we have uplink transmission, communication users wanting to send signals to the base station. Now, the base station acting as the receiver, as an Isaac receiver, a dual functional sensing and communication receiver, it has two things it wants to do. First is estimate the signals of these users, and at the same time, estimate the direction or the location of these users. And if you look at the math, this is our usual MIMO system model. That means estimating information. So I don't know information and I estimate it. And estimating uh, communication information and radar information, so angles, distances, and so on, will live inside the, the channel, right? The, the communication channel, the propagation channel here. Uh, so uh, in these scenarios, are, these are very challenging because you don't know the channel, you don't know the data but still you want to estimate uh, both, right? And as I said, the radar parameters, angles, uh, path losses, and distances will live inside the channel. Uh, and there are some uh, more classical approaches based on compressive sensing that you can use to tackle this problem where you don't know any of these guys, you must estimate both. And there's plenty of space to develop a deep learning approach in this uh, space. And uh, we ourselves are working on uh, developing Deep learning, uh, and I don't have yet the results to report, but I think it's a very um, open uh, research study. Uh, and uh, it's just if I wanted to summarize here, so for the integrated sensing communication paradigm, I think there's plenty of uh, space to develop learning based solutions, so AI based solutions, to tackle complex optimization problems where even if you have an analytical solution, it's too complex to run it in, in practical uh, scenarios. So to address complex joint communication radar metrics, such as the CRB or weighted CRB with sum rate and many other combinations. And also something I didn't show explicitly, uh, look at complex target 
uh, representations. So you can have either simple point target representations, but once you consider the volume of the target, then the analytical complexity of the problem explodes. Right? You have a multi-dimensional, and you can use machine learning there to have significant complexity. Uh, and in terms of receive uh, processing, uh, what I said, so the joint data and target detection is a, is a challenging one. And again, there's, uh, there's ways of uh, dealing with this with uh, AI. Uh, I probably won't have much time to, to talk about this, but there's uh, space in, in uh, uh, developing techniques for uh, uh, these synergies that I spoke about. So uh, here's an example in a vehicular network. In a vehicular network, it's often, often very difficult to have a high gain beam tracking the communication users, right? the communication user that it's, uh, is inside a car. For and radar can provide a solution here because you can use the echo to estimate the location. You can use prediction and learning to basically predict where you want to point your next beam. And that means fast beam adaptation with minimal overheads and, and so on, which would, you would have in communication only scenarios. Uh, I don't have the time to explain this, but the main message is we look at a scenario where we have a very simple scenario where a car goes in a straight line and we're trying to communicate with a car through this base station. Uh, and the main message is the classical communication only approaches this guy and this guy over here uh, underperform in this scenario because the direction changes so fast I cannot track the beam. While the, the radar assisted approach, exploiting radar to track the vehicle, performs much, much better in these scenarios. And you can use learning based approaches. Here's an example of factor graph representation to do this adaptation and prediction. Again, no time to go through this in detail uh, to further improve your estimation performance. So here we have the CDF, the cumulative density function of the angle error. And you can see that this, uh, the red line, which represents the factor graph approach, outperforms uh, the Kalman filtering and linear prediction uh, approach. And you can use a learning-based approach to, to deal with uh, complex trajectories, like uh, curved trajectories or roundabouts and so on. And, and these things work in, in uh, these scenarios. You can also use uh, machine learning. Uh, complexity increases dramatically when you have multiple vehicles to, to track and communicate. And um, uh, so that's where uh, a wide open field uh, where uh, machine learning can be. Again, to summarize, machine learning in these scenarios to deal with complex trajectories. What happens if I'm not in a straight line and it's not easy to describe it with math? What happens when I have multiple vehicles? So the, the, the dimensionality of the of the system increases. And also something uh, very interesting is data association. So once you have sensing assisted approaches, there's no direct communication or ID for every user. So how do you deal with uh, knowing which data corresponds to which communication user, right? And there's many ways you can uh, exploit learning uh, to use the radar cross section of the vehicles as a unique ID for each uh, user. And a final thing uh, I want to squeeze in, if I have the time, we're talking about sustainability and uh, you know, um, uh, climate change. So towards net zero energy communications, um, an important area is um, integration with renewable sources. So having these uh, communication networks, not powered by the grid, but powered by energy sources. And this is not just an energy efficient design, but it's an enabling design in many scenarios such as remote connectivity, where you may not have a power grid, or emergency scenarios, disaster areas where the power grid has gone down, or special events where it's just not convenient to plug things in, a, in the grid. And we've had a, a European project, uh, Painless, uh, for the last five years, working in these areas. And I would invite you to, to check our website to find out more about it. But in terms of um, uh, learning-based approaches, I think these are uh, two important areas where there's a lot of scope in developing these. So as I said, the hybrid power, uh, um, dual functional base station. So a base station that is not plugged in anymore. So an access point really, uh, but is powered by uh, renewable energy. So modeling these energies, modeling um, uh, energy storage in batteries is quite complex analytically. And integrating these with power consumption uh, further increases the complexity. So plenty of scope in 
creating uh, learning-based approaches in this space. And if we talk about uh, you know, going beyond the reach of the power grid and going in remote areas, UAVs will play a role. And then there's many problems in how you design the trajectory of the UAV, taking into account energy and its batteries, what is the most energy efficient directory to serve users or sense uh, the environment, and so on. Again, these can be um, uh, quite complex scenarios. Again, there's scope to, to develop uh, learning-based approaches. So I think many, many problems for any of you who's interested in these areas to, 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 to apply your learning-based approaches uh, and many um, years of fruitful research uh, to, to come from this. So I'll finish by uh, advertising our upcoming book. Anybody who's interested in integrated sensing and communications, we have a book coming up in the next couple of months from Springer which has a wide coverage of uh, many uh, areas and problems within integrated sensing and communications. And we'll soon be hiring. We have a new uh, European project coming up. If you're interested in uh, ISAC, sensing and communications for vehicular environments, uh, this consortium has been funded. It will be starting soon in January. So uh, keep an eye on uh, job advertisements for any of these partners. And if you're interested, feel free to, to join. Glad to join. Uh, again, a number of references, um, overviews, uh, uh, coexistence, uh, papers on coexistence, papers on dual functional transmission, on hardware efficient transmission, on security, which I think is a unique um, uh, challenge for DFRC, Isaac, on vehicular, Isaac, and our experiments um, uh, over the air transmission of these. Uh, and with that, I'll end here. I'd like to very gratefully thank. Uh, the members in my team that have worked in these areas over the years and also acknowledge uh, the funding that's supported our research um, in these areas. So I'll stop here and I'm happy to ask, uh, answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Christos. This, this was a great talk. And uh, I would like to just add that uh, uh, this is probably the first in series of talks which we invited for um, in correlation with the AI for Good uh, Summit and the ML, ML in Communications workshop that we are having on 5th of July. Unfortunately, Christos is not able to make it. So thank you, Christos, for taking the time today. We don't have much time for, uh, for um, the questions. Uh, however, I want to ask, uh, I want to ask one uh, very interesting point that you have told. Um, the the are the are the most of the studies downlink uh, or do you have uplink studies also do you uh, i i remember in one of the slides you did mention uh, the ue based studies but um, in general uh, what what is the research on the uplink um, and uh, could you could you talk a little bit about uh, about the the studies on the uplink yeah so um the stuff I, I spoke about in the first part of the talk, so the interference exploitation, uh, applies only on the downlink, right? Because to characterize interference, you need to know not just the channel, but also the data you want to transmit. Uh, and that means, you know, it's, it can only happen at a base station that knows the data it wants to transmit on the users and has some CSR. So this is only applicable in downlink. Um, now, um, in the in the radar and communications um, uh, domain, um, there's challenges in the downlink. I briefly mentioned the receiver design. Sorry, the uplink. I briefly mentioned the receiver design, where you have uplink transmission. You want to detect the signals that are being transmitted, and at the same time localize, let's say, the users. So I think there's there's many open problems in, in how to do that. It's a very challenging one, um, and of course. You know, you, you can think of every every time you do a um, even in the downlink transmission when you have joint sensing, every time you you transmit a signal for the radar purposes, you need to be listening for radar X, and that's kind of emulates let's say an uplink information uh, transmission, right? So uh, a thing I didn't mention is that there's uh, you know uh, if you're if you're familiar with full duplex uh, transmission or so simultaneous simultaneous transmit and receive. I think this is a great application for developing full duplex uh, approach. Again, even there, there's many open problems in terms of modeling, 
self-interference, molding the hardware, modeling the antennas to again scope to develop uh, machine learning. Thank you very much. Um, maybe maybe the, uh, the uh, Rodrigo is asking a question. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Rodrigo, I, I know you you are working on the uh, vehicular data set as well. He says uh, quite striking that constructive uh, interference is a useful tool even for non-constant modulus QAM uh, constellations. I guess the constructive interference analysis must favor some constellation over others. Uh, which modulation scheme would someone advocate? Uh, that's what his question is. Yeah. Yeah, great question. Thank you, Rodrigo. So, uh, so two parts of this uh, of the answer. So, first of all, uh, you know, we we uh, we we deal with constructive interference. You know the best place to to find um, to apply constructive interference is in interference limited scenarios, right? In places where you have a lot of interference. In such uh, scenarios, you typically um, have a, a low signal to noise ratio, so you apply low order modulation. So uh, you would favor PSK in such scenarios. Of course, you know in in future networks you're going to have you know the the extremely uh, high order modulation, like 1024 QAM, for example. Um, and we've seen, we have studies that show that, uh, you know, constructive interference applies to 16 QAM, 64 QAM, but I wouldn't use it, you know, in high SNR scenarios with, you know, extreme uh, uh, modulation orders. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's not, I don't think it's a question of, you know, which modulation scheme is, is going to be the best, let's say, but of course, different modulation schemes for different scenarios. And when you have an interference limited scenario, uh, you know, interference exploitation can provide significant gains in terms of energy saving. Thank you so much. Um, I, I have uh, maybe uh, I, actually your 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 explanations on the TRB minimization was quite interesting. Uh, personally, I find the POC setup, the experimental setup, which you had quite interesting as well. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for uh, for that paper there. Um, uh, the, the number of antenna arrays, uh, are they fixed uh, or do you vary it at all? Uh, I know, I know you are, you are varying the priority for the radar, but uh, the number of antenna arrays, are they fixed or do you vary it at all? So in the experiment, uh, I mean, we, we have a fixed um, uh, array, right? We have an, an array of six antennas in that experiment. Uh, so, I mean, I don't think it's practical to adapt the antennas as you go, right? In a, in a, in a let's say, a practical scenario, you would have a base station with a fixed number of antennas. So you can um, uh, change the priority, uh, or you can, you know, somehow influence the loading of the cell if, if you want to prioritize one another. You we'll serve less users uh, to, to, to have a better rate of performance. But, so there's all kinds of trade offs that you can make. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, you talked about quantization. Uh, did you did you apply it in this case as well? I mean, in case of CRB optimization also, did you use that? Uh, no, we haven't had the time to do it yet. But it's uh, I think it's an interesting problem. Uh, it's on our list of things to do. And again, I would sure. expect you have similar trade-offs uh, now between communications, sensing, and memory, and, so, uh, and computation. So I think it's a very interesting uh, topic to explore. In the, I think in the in part one uh, of your talk, you did talk about. I mean, there was really quantization applied there already. Mm, in that case, uh, in your experimental setup, where where did you run the inference at all? Was it in the host or in the USRP or or somewhere else? No, it, the experimental setup was not the, the learning-based approach. It was the optimization-based approach. Um, but uh, I mean, if you want to apply the learning-based approach in practice, I guess you can run the um, the inference um, on, on a let's say an offline mode, as, as as long as you have you know some sort of channel estimation. And then it's the training that's going to be challenging to, to run. Sorry, the, the training you can run offline is the inference that's going to be the challenging. 
but again, uh, this is work in progress. We haven't had a chance to work. Okay. Are you are you looking at collecting data sets for this space as well? Um, so I'm aware of a few uh, communications data sets around the world. Uh, I think what is interesting is creating data sets for comms and sensors. So there's, uh, there's two data sets for this uh, space that I'm aware of. One is in the US. Um, so Professor Al-Khatib in the US, I forget now where he's based, where he has um, uh, uh, a, a rather a sizable, let's say, uh, data uh, library for these uh, sensing scenarios or sensing assisted communications. I'm aware of efforts from, uh, from the group of uh, Professor um, uh, Wei Jie, um, in uh, Yuan in uh, in China again, I forget which university who is uh, collecting a data set for gesture recognition to to ICE. But again, uh, that's another interesting point. Wide open, uh, you know, uh, area of development. So collecting data sets for these kind of uh, systems. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, interesting. I I think we will. Uh, we will probably contact you offline because we, you know, we, we have some interesting data sets. We, we have a challenge which we open to participants for with public data and so on. So in that sense, we are quite interested to find out uh, about the data sets. Um, uh, maybe, maybe a philosophical question. <laughs> the, I mean, in this talk, you have looked at only existing uh, constructive interference. Uh, what would you what would you do uh, or what are your thoughts on introducing uh, constructive interface? Is there uh, is there some thought uh, process? Is there some research on those lines at all? Mm -hmm. I know I know you are um, I know there are there are existing works on uh, RIS and so on, but I'm not uh, I'm not asking specifically about that. I'm just asking. In general, your talk is on existing constructive interference and what would you do uh, going forward to, let's say, if you have to introduce and uh, get uh, proactive with uh, constructive interference? Does it make sense at all? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I mean, our, our focus has been, I mean, we've, we've been uh, taking this from the angle of, you know, interference is there. Uh, we're avoiding it. You know, we're treating it as a harmful uh, issue. Why not just harvest interference, right, and reuse it? So that's been our purpose, and that's why we've been focusing on, you know, uh, using existing interference. Uh, but of course, you know, interference comes from in these scenarios that we looked at comes from the correlation of channels, right? When you have highly correlated channels, you have a lot of interference. So you could use techniques if you want to exploit this to to artificially correlate the channels. And it's interesting you mentioned RIS because RIS is one of the techniques to engineer the, the propagation channel, right? And there's and there's others as well. Uh, but yeah, I think that's uh, that's that's another interesting direct where you can actually engineer the channel to increase correlation, increase interference, and benefit. I'm not sure if it's worthwhile, but it's uh, you know it's uh, it's an idea. Cool, cool, yeah. Uh, maybe maybe last question before we close. W what is um, I, I remember your previous talk. Uh, I mean that was uh, that was probably uh, focusing on uh, integrated sensing and communications. But here now, uh, it, when I when I talk to you, I didn't understand the offline. But now it's quite clear that you have probably looked at a broader scope of things, uh, brought in constructive interference and then looked at optimization techniques and so on. Uh, now I understand what you were talking about. Uh, what is next year? So, so let's say if we were to talk to you next year, where are things going? Um, uh, there are some, uh, some future work slides which you showed. Uh, that's quite, quite exciting. But in general, as closing remarks, what would you think of uh, uh, future work in this area? Especially from your team, yeah. Sure. Um, I mean, I'll start from Isaac because uh, you know that's a big part of our focus these days. So recently, uh, we've been very interested in the security challenges for Isaac, and I think these are very interesting and very unique. So I guess that you know the results we'll be seeing from our team in the next few years are going to be on security, on how to make uh, 
the ISAC systems secure for data transmission, but also securing the sense. So what happens when you have a node that wants to exploit the infrastructure to sense when it's not supposed to be sent? So that's an, an entirely new paradigm. Uh, now, in terms of symbol level precoding, there's many applications of this. I, I, I basically showed a, a very elementary downlink scenario, but there's many scenarios where you can apply it. Uh, even RISs, for example, you know, RIS assisted scenarios, um, and many others. I mean, uh, uh, wireless power transfer, which is probably relevant to you know, efficiency and um, uh, grid, uh, gridless operation, and many others, many others, too many. You know, but I think there's both topics that I discussed are wide open and the very open topics that they want to do. Thank you so much, Christos. Thank you for patiently answering all the questions. Uh, Mia is here. Uh, back to you, Mia. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everyone, for sparing your valuable time to join today's session. And thank you very much, Christos, for today's technical talk, as well as Vishnu for moderating the Q&A session. We do have more sessions planned in the near future, so please make sure to check the AF for Good program page for more details. You can also interact with us and other participants on the Challenge Site channel. So we look forward to seeing you participate in the 2023 edition of the ITU AIML and 5G Challenge. So thank you again and hopefully see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for good program. Let's shape the future of AI for good. AI is a powerful tool. summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values.